So I want to thank everyone. I'm Linda from the Upper Saddle River Library. I want to thank everyone who's attending our Mahjong Charleston Skills Workshop. But Michelle will touch on a few other things. Uh, we have Michelle Frizzell from Mahjong Central. Um, as I said before, I am going to mute everybody, but if you want to ask questions during the presentation, uh, either in the chat or unmute yourself, at the end we'll have a chance for some questions and answers, I think. And with that, um, I am going to let Michelle just take it away. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me here. And it's really nice to meet you all. Uh, now, I wanted to just get hands in the room. How many of you have been playing for less than a year? Okay, less than three years. Maybe. Okay, less than five years. Less than eight years. Well, let's see, I was going about that the wrong way, wasn't I? <laughs> okay, so I think that y'all kind of got the gist. I just wanted to see how long people have been playing. One, three, five, eight, under 10 years. So um, thank you for doing that. Um, now, really, it depends too on how often you play, not just how long you've been playing, because if you're playing for a year or two, but you only play maybe once a month, you may, you might not increase your skills because of the recurrence. But if you play more often, really the more you play, the better you get. So I know too, a lot of people are playing online. So how many of you are playing online? Just raise, raise your hands if you're playing online. Okay. And how many of you play at realmahjong.net, I believe is the name, realmahjong.net? Um, so, um, the, what was the other one that you were saying people are playing at? Uh, my Mahjong? My, my, my Zhang, my Zhang. 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 Net. That, that was it. Okay. How about re, uh, Mahjong time? Anybody playing at Mahjong time? Okay. So Mahjong time is where I play and you'll get a little glimpse of what it's like to play at Mahjong time. Cause I'm going to show some, uh, hands that we're going to demonstrate some of these strategies at Mahjong time. So if any of you incidentally want to try Mahjong time, they do have a, a 30 day VIP trial, send me an email and I can send you information about their trial and you can try it out. We're going to be in the Mahjong school where you play against robots. So we're not going to play against real people. And that's kind of nice because we can take all the time we need on a given hand. And you'll have opportunities to ask, ask questions as we go as well. And incidentally, we're going to provide a handout. So you'll, if you wanna take notes of Ken, uh, you can feel free, but we will also be sending a handout after the event. So everything that, that I share today will be in that handout. And also everything that I share is on my YouTube channel. Do you all know about my YouTube channel? Have you heard of Mahjong Central? No? Uh, I started a YouTube channel in 2017 and I have thousands of videos on Mahjong. Now I do have videos on other versions, but since uh, 2000 and well, really 2020, I started to niche down to with just videos on American Mahjong. So most of the videos on my channel are for American Mahjong. Just look for red, white, and blue thumbnails on the videos and those will be for American Mahjong. And everything that we talk about today is in videos on my channel. So and I'll send it all out afterwards, as you were saying. When I send out with the worksheet, I'll send out all of uh, Michelle's information too. So now you can stalk her the way that I stalk her <laughs> on her YouTube videos. Yeah, and on, on the YouTube videos, you're always welcome to leave comments, questions under the videos. But I also have a, a Facebook group and you can ask any kind of questions there too. Now, today we're going to start out by talking about identifying the strength in a dealt hand. We're just going to do one exercise for that because we really want to focus on Charleston skill building because that's half the game. If you can master the Charleston, you can master the game. The Charleston is the time, as you well know, it's the time when you can exponentially build your hand and improve it from its initial state to 
the place where you then start picking and discarding one tile at a time. Since you get three tiles at a time, you can really improve your hand with the right decisions at the right time. And we're gonna talk about that in when we, when we get to Charleston modeling. So those are the topics that we're gonna talk about and time permitting, we'll also do a demonstration on strategy by wall, which is a strategy based on the wall in play. So it goes beyond the Charleston. And again, if we have time, we'll go into it. Otherwise, it'll be part of your handout and you're welcome to read about it. And also you can watch videos on it on my YouTube channel. So shall we get started and do a random pull? All right, I'm gonna pull up my, my uh, let's see here, I'll share my screen. Let's see if it's, oh, here we go. All right, can everybody see my screen? I can. Oh, and let me just do this. If, if you guys give me a thumbs up, if I ask, because you're muted, if you give me thumbs up, if you can hear me. And then also, if you really like what you can see, you can give me applause by doing this. Or if you have a question, you can put up your hand or write something in chat, okay? And uh, actually, you know what? We could open it up if, if you would like, and we can take questions as we go. Um, because we're gonna get into uh, the random pull so a, a lot of times people might have a question because we all use uh, instructors, we use different kind of terminology. Oh, let's see, which screen do you guys see? Do you see my, Mahjong time or do you see my calendar? It looks like Mahjong time. It says free practice oh. table, it's a list. Okay, good, good. Because it looks like the screen sharing is on my other monitor, but um, all right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and join a table here. Here's one. And then also you can mute your computer sound and that way we won't get an echo. So mute or, or let's see, how would you do that? There, there's an echo. Let's see. All right. So I'm going to try to join a game here. We're hoping to here we go. All right, so you can see the robots here and we're going into a table and they're gonna deal the tiles out here. And we'll have, with the games at Mahjong time, you have a, an hour to play one game. So you can take all the time you need with each pass and each pick and discard. And incidentally, you can play up to four games free as a free member and then they have paid subscriptions as well. So here we have our tiles and you can see we have a couple of jokers, which is nice. We have a flower and then we have some cracks. We have one, three, six, seven with pairs of ones and sixes. And then we have a one dot, five dot, seven dot and a couple of wins. So when you get your dealt hand, you want to look for the strength of the hand and the strength of the hand could be one of two things uh, in this strategy that I'm sharing. There are a lot of ways, you know, that you can apply strategy, but this, these are the two that I'm, I'm going to share with you now. Uh, one is to build around multiples. Multiples are pairs, pungs, kongs, not considering jokers at the moment. So if we were to look at this hand and see the ones and the sixes, those would be the multiples. We have two. So I would look at those two multiples and then look at the rest of the tiles in the hand and keep the most of those tiles and play a category that would support the multiple with most of the tiles. So you can see here that we have uh, one, three, one, five, and then a flower. So you might think, well, we could play little odds, one, three, five. And then we have also six, seven, and five, seven. So we could play consecutive run. Either of those choices would build around one of the multiples. And in this case, these multiples, ones and sixes, don't go together in one suit on the card this year. So we have to pick one or the other. And I would just pick the one that would use most of my tiles. So I think in this case, if this were my hand, I probably would play consecutive run. Raise your hand if you agree. And I, I, I don't see uh, the calendar view. 
um, or not calendar view, but a gallery view. How many of you would play consecutive run with these tiles? Actually, maybe we could unmute. Or if people want to put in the chat, if you oh. see the chat button on the bottom. Okay. You can put in the chat button as well and I can, I can. Read oh, it that's out. good. Okay. So maybe let's get or, a consensus. How many of you would play consecutive run? Uh, in the chat, write CR in caps if you would play consecutive run. If you would play little odds, uh, write LO. And I think either one would be viable. So this would be um, the, the strength of this hand would be building around the sixes with consecutive run. And I would say that's primarily because consecutive run is the most flexible category on the card. So in addition to a multiple, you would play consecutive run and have uh, optimized this dealt hand. So that's I'm gonna do- That's what people are, are typing in the most of. Uh, I'm sorry, you're saying, let's see Consecutive here. run, most people are saying consecutive. Really, consecutive run, okay, great. I think we should do one more, um, just so you can see, I wanna see if we can get uh, a, draw, a draw where there are no multiples. Uh, so I'm going to exit the table here. Let's see. Um, I, hold on one second. I got not responding here. Bear with me. Tech issues. We've got gremlins. Okay, here we go. So if I'm going to join, uh, let's see, go back to school, Mahjong school, and we'll join another pra practice table, free practice table. It'll let me join. And once we get in, it'll deal a hand and we'll do one more of these and then we'll start doing Charleston modeling. So while this is loading, there are a couple of, of things I wanna share about style of play. And style of play, I think, depends on how long you've been playing. I think a lot of new players tend to wanna to pick a hand right away, but the, the most, efficient way to play the game is to not pick a hand right away. You want to stay as flexible as you can and maybe play at the category level so that you have that flexibility depending on what happens at the table, whether you're during, you know, in, in the Charleston where you have passes going around or during the pick and discard phase of the game when you start seeing exposures and discards the longer you stay at the category level, the more flexibility you'll have to change your hand based on the situations that happen at the table. So I, there are, are two different styles of play that I just wanna to touch on real quick. And that is um, what I call fixed, where you pick a hand and play it out until you can no longer play it out and then switch either to another hand or a uh, switch to defense because you're not able to play that hand. And then the other one is what I call adaptive, where you do not pick a hand until you either run out of discards or you're forced to pick a hand because your tiles are being discarded and you decide, yeah, I need to commit and make an exposure. So in chat, write a F if you play fixed and write a, an A if you play adaptive. And if you do a hybrid where maybe you're adaptive during the Charleston and then you pick a hand early, write A and then F, or write H for hybrid. So it would be F for fixed, A for adaptive, and H for hybrid. And it'll be interesting to see what we have um, in, in the uh, audience. So I'm gonna go ahead and sort these tiles. And here we have a lot of BAMs. We have three, four, five, six, eight, nine, pair of nines. Then we have seven, eight in cracks, five, seven in dots, a green dragon and a south. And what some people might be tempted to do is just hold bams. But because of American Mahjong, it's really not about suits per se. It's about multiples. American Mahjong is a game of multiples. So I did an analysis uh, I do an analysis every year, actually, and consistently since I've been doing these analyses for the last, well, since 2017, about 80% of the card is with pairs, punks, kongs, even quints. So 
less than 20% really have singles and pairs. So Mahjong for American style is about multiples. If you build around multiples and let that be where your eye goes when you first get your drawn tiles and you build around the multiple, you are optimizing your hand from the get go versus playing maybe all bands because look at all these bands we have. It's not about the suit, it's about the multiple. So in this case, I would say the strength of this hand is gonna be whatever category we can play that holds the most of these tiles using the nines because that's our only multiple. So I would say hold the nines and then I would look at the rest of my tiles and pick a category that uses most of my tiles. So we do happen to have consecutive tiles, seven, eight. So I would hold all seven, eight. So those I would hold, I would even hold the six because on the card in uh, this year anyway, there's a range of, of consecutive rend that is four numbers, sometimes five, but I usually hold a range around four numbers because that tends to be, give you the most flexibility in mixed suits. I would also probably hold the dragon. We do have some slight potential for 369 as a plan B. So you can see here we have 369 dragon. And for that particular hand, which is the third hand down under 369, Pung Kong, Pung Kong, 369 with the matching dragon, no gaps there. And that's another thing that we're going to talk about later as a strategy. So one of the things that I want to talk about now that we're doing the random pull, identifying the strength of a dealt hand is once you identify the strength, all you need to do is find three tiles to pass and you can stop the analysis. I think sometimes people um, tend to overanalyze. Really during the Charleston, all you need to do is find three tiles to pass and then you can stop the analysis because you're gonna get three more tiles that could potentially make you start from scratch depending on what you get. So once you're able to pick three tiles out, you can stop the analysis. For this particular dealt hand, I would say consecutive run is the predominant pattern. And that reminds me that if you don't have multiples in, the, in these two random pulls, we happen to have a multiple, but sometimes you don't get a multiple. You, don't, you get all singles. When that happens, you wanna look for the predominant pattern. The predominant pattern is going to be a category on the card. So for example, if you have mostly evens, keep all your evens, no matter what suit it is, keep all the evens and pass the odds. Same thing with odds. If you have mostly odds, keep all the odds and pass your evens and then wins and dragons and things like that. And we're gonna talk about strategy with passing shortly. So for this particular starting hand or dealt hand, I would say a good pass would be four five south. It's a little bit risky with the four five, but at least it's one of each suit. And you know, it, every pass has some level of risk. So you wanna do the best you can in picking out your passes, build your hand first, that's priority one, and then mitigate the risk with the rest of your tiles and pass as defensively as you can. Sometimes you're gonna pass risky and that's okay if that's all you got. So in this case, I would say that would be the best pass. So any questions about random pulls and identifying the strength in a dealt hand, building around multiples or the predominant pattern? Anybody have any questions about that? No? All right, shall we get into some Charleston modeling now? Oh, I, you know what? I could have just done it right here. I Let's see if the game will, oh, it's gonna exit me. I hit exit. I could have just done Charleston modeling from here. So while we're exiting and we'll do a new random poll and then we'll go into Charleston modeling, um, one of the guidelines that I give myself and that I recommend is that you want to, uh, or as kind of a litmus test on decision-making at the end of the Charleston, if you have four discards or less, I would call that a successful Charleston. If you have more than four discards at the end of the Charleston, you're likely going to be an underdog in that game. But, you know, underdogs do win. So don't be discouraged if you have more than four discards. So let's join a 
another school game here. We'll join here this practice table and then we'll do some Charleston modeling. So uh, we're going to do, we're going to look for the, per, the predominant pattern or the a multiple and build around that. So the strength of the hand is what we're going to look for. And then we're going to identify tiles to pass. And as soon as we get in, we'll be able to do that. So bear with me. Here we go. Here's our robots. Here come the tiles. Let's see what we get. Okay, we have no multiples. So this would be the time when you would pick the predominant pattern. And here we have one, two, three in BAMs, four, seven in cracks, one, three, five, seven, nine in dots. And oh, there's a multiple right there, the ones. So that's where I would build from the one. And we actually have one, three, five, seven, nine, the very first hand, pair, pair, pung, pung, kong, one suit. And we have no gaps for that hand. And so I would even say that would be the category to play, not necessarily pick the hand because during the Charleston, we might build with big odds or little odds and switch. So you don't have to pick a hand, but we do actually have no gaps for that very first hand. So for passing, I would pass one wind and then I'd probably do an odd with an even in the off suit. So let's say, for example, the four crack and a two bam. And that way we're keeping all the odds. So let's go ahead and pass. And we'll get our incoming tiles. So we have odds, three and five. And this, this is uh, interesting because a moment ago I was saying we could potentially pick the hand, that very first hand under odds, but now which would be that pair, pair, pung, pung, kong, one suit, one, three, five, seven, nine, for anyone who doesn't have their card. We could pick that, but we would have to throw away a pair of threes. And as I was saying earlier, if you build around multiples, you're going to optimize your hand. So what I would do is switch to little odds, and I would hold one, three, five. We even have a hand we could play with two multiples as opposed to just one, and that would be the third hand down. So I would hold one, three in bands or three, five in bands, one, three in dots for that third hand down. We could still potentially play the first hand. So we're just going to play at the category level as long as we can. We don't technically have to pick a hand until we run out of our discards. And in this case, I would say these would be discards that we really don't need. We've got two options. So we're playing category level odds. And there goes our, our first pass, or second pass. Sorry, we're going across, I think. Going across. OK, so now we have a five. So now we have three multiples. Now I think really with three multiples, I if these were my tiles, I would probably focus on one, three, three, five, third hand down. And then I would start letting these tiles go. I want to talk about the white dragon really quick by by show of hands or not show of hands since we're in this view. Um, let's see write a one if you would pass a white dragon without any thought. Write a two in chat if you tend to hold white dragons and not pass them because they're a risky tile either one and there's really no tech no real right or wrong answer but it is a dual tile so it can be a valuable tile for some people so let me know if what people are writing one primarily or two one would be you don't really care about passing white dragon you'd pass it without a thought or two that you tend not to pass white dragons i'm a two personally so I, I'm not going to pass that. I think I would pass probably one six and maybe give up a big number in here, maybe the nine. So this is what I would pass. We're building on little odds, one, three, three, five. We have no gaps for that third hand down. Okay, so we didn't pick up a multiple here. Um, incidentally, we do have now one through five. I don't know if any of you see this. 
but we have one through five with two multiples. So that has equal potential to one, three, five. One, three, three, five, third hand down. And this is why you don't really want to pick a hand yet, because if you fill in those gaps with odds, you can easily play consecutive run. And here we actually have tiles we can pass. We have a six, bam, seven dot, five dot. Now this is a very risky pass. Raise your hand if you think it is. Would this be a risky pass to you? Yes or no? So I would not pass that. To me, that is very risky. Since we have no gaps for consecutive run in one suit, I would switch from one, three, five to consecutive run, and I would break this up at least to make it a little less risky and focus on one suit and switch from odds to consecutive run. Let's see if it pans out. There's another multiple. So we have a multiple with consecutive run. Now we have three multiples in here, two, three, five, and we have tiles we can pass. This actually is a really great pass, one, seven dot, and then a four crack, mixed suits, big numbers, little numbers. And we picked up another multiple with the one. You know, if we had flowers and green dragons, we might even be able to play that pair hand. Second pair hand down the consecutive run with five in a sequence and a pair of flowers. Now we did pick up a multiple here with the two crack. Anytime you build another multiple, you should always reassess. But because we have one, two, three, four multiples in one through five, I would not go with the two crack. It doesn't really fit the predominant strength of the hand, which is bams. So I would break up the two at this point. So we're going to pass those and we're looking for one through five. We're playing the very first hand under consecutive run and we've got another multiple. Oh, no, no. Now here, this is interesting. We have pair, pung, pair, single pair. So the first hand under consecutive run, we only need a pair in there. So we could probably let the two go or switch maybe to that second hand down if we get flowers. So we're going to say we want three tiles and we'll pass these three here on the end. See if we get any keepers. Right now, I would probably say the two BAM can go. So we don't have any keepers. And in this particular Charleston modeling, we have five discards. So I'd say that we're gonna be an underdog, but we could, we could pung the three we have our pairs. So even though we have five discards, I think that having no gaps and four multiples has created a pretty strong hand. So let's do another one. Does anybody have any questions about that modeling exercise? And feel free to unmute yourselves, guys, if you wanna ask a particular question. I, I know, cause I've watched Michelle before and if anybody else was looking at the risky hands, that was because it was the three consecutive, even though numbers, even though they were in different suits. And that's why you were concerned about that. Correct? That yeah. you didn't wanna do the risky move. Yeah, and you wanna, you wanna mitigate the risk. There's gonna be risk in every pass, no matter what. There will always be risk. You just want to make it as benign as possible because you're passing tiles to an opponent. So you have to think about what is in your own hand, building your hand as the first priority and then mitigate the risk in your passing tiles. So we're going to go back into school and we'll open another free practice table and we'll do another, another Charleston modeling. So one of the, I have kind of a, a worst case, a best to worst case scenario in the handout. And maybe I'll, uh, I'm going to bring this in. It'll give you a little sneak peek of the handout that you're going to get. Can you all see this? Let's see here. We have your screen up. So it, we're just seeing your, your screen right now. 
Yeah. Okay, good. So in the, in, and this kind of goes into a little bit because we're focused on uh, Charleston modeling. This is uh, during when the first and second wall are in play. Basically we deal through the first wall and we have uh, half of the second wall left. So during the Charleston, these are the strategies that I've been sharing here. Um, I'm sure you all know how to arrange tiles, so we don't need to talk about that, but we start at that real fundamental level of arranging your tiles in order and in suit, um, and then looking for the, the multiples. If you don't have multiples, look for the predominant pattern and build around them. If you don't have multiples, then you want to choose a category that uses most of your tiles around that predominant pattern. And when a multiple forms, you reassess building around the multiple. Because like I was sharing earlier, American Mahjong is a game of multiples. So you will optimize your potential if you build around multiples as opposed to a suit or a pattern. So uh, let's see, if the choice, this is an interesting one that is proven, if your choice is unclear and you're in between categories, either pick the category that uses most of your tiles or most of your multiples. Most of your multiples being optimal. If, you're, if it's equitable and one of those categories is consecutive run, go with consecutive run because that is the most flexible category on the card. And if you're building around the predominant pattern or your multiples, and you're choosing consecutive run, you're really optimizing for a win in, in that particular case. Um, so you want to, um, this, this is what I call the best to worst case passing. Uh, so one, the first one is the best kind of pass you can do. And then down at the bottoms, it, it, it gets more and more risky. So the first is a different number tile from each suit, little and big numbers then a single wind or dragon with mixed numbered or mixed suits. Next is all the same category, getting a little risky. Like if you pass three, six, nine, all three, six, nine tiles, that's a little risky. Or <coughs> excuse me, let's say you pass two wins and a number. That's a little bit risky, especially when news is on the card. Passing two wins is liken to like numbers. It's almost as risky as passing a pair. So depending on what is in my hand, I will try not to pass two wins or two dragons for that matter. Uh, the next one is all in the same suit. It's very risky, more so than number one. It, again, it, it's going down in severity in risk. White dragons or flowers. I don't know how many of you ever pass flowers, but I very rarely pass flowers. And then finally, like numbers or pairs. Now, pairs is the most risky pass you can send. Like numbers is a step down from a pair, but it's almost as risky because there are like numbers all over this card. And, and that's true for every year, by the way. Like numbers, if you pass like numbers, it's almost as risky as passing a pair. So that's best to worst case scenario on passing tiles. And uh, it, does anybody have any question about that or any, um, any uh, other ideas? Of course, you could always send me an email or put a chat in any of my videos because I talk a lot about all of that. Um, so, and then if, if you want to speak up, you could always unmute and ask a question or make a point if you like. Uh, so here's our next Charleston draw or our random pull. We're going to go into Charleston modeling and we have one multiple. We have a pair of flowers. So this is a, a interesting thing because flowers are in every category on the card. So while I am happy that we have a pair of flowers, I don't necessarily want to make that my decision making at the moment because we can play any category on the card with those flowers. What I want to look at is the rest of my tiles and what I have the most of that can be used with those flowers and then pick the category that uses most of my tiles. Because as you see with all the rest of the tiles, there are no multiples. So we're going to pick the predominant pattern. The predominant pattern here, I would say, 
is going to be five through nine consecutive run. Five through nine. We even have five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I would probably pass these little numbers with one wind. So I would keep the flowers, of course, and then five through nine. And I'm not so focused on suit. We're just going to gather till we run out of discards. This would be called playing at the category level or playing adaptive. So we're going to pass, let's say, a West, a two, and a one. And this is a little bit risky, but we're passing as, as benign as we can with our remaining tiles while still building our hand. So it's the best we can do. A little bit of risk, but that's okay. As I was saying earlier, every pass has some level of risk. So, you know, try not to um, be hard on yourself for sending a risky pass. It happens. Okay, so we picked up a multiple and we have our first number tile with a multiple and it fits right in with our consecutive run. And there are a few hands or two hands really in one suit anyway in consecutive run that can use the pair of eights with those other tiles. And that would be the second hand down or probably the sixth hand down. So we do have some choices. And incidentally, if we get green dragons, we might even be able to play the pair hand, second one down. So let's go ahead and pass a wind, a little number and a big number in a, in a different suit. We uh, are pairs with eights, so I wouldn't consider five, seven, nine here. Even though we have a lot of five, seven, nine, that multiple has a heavier weight to it. There's more strength around the eight with consecutive numbers than five, seven, nine, even with more tiles. So let's pass south one, five. So we're building around the eight. Let's see what we get. We got a keeper, a seven. So we're still in consecutive run. Likely, I would say either second hand down still or the six hand down. Um, and if we get the green dragon, we could maybe play that um, pair hand. So now we're gonna let go of one of the big numbers here. I'd say one of each suit, this is a great pass. One, four, nine, great pass. One of each suit, big numbers, little num uh, big number, little numbers you're probably going to hit one, one tile for them. And now we have a five. I would love to get a green dragon at this point because we're, we're building what looks like a pear hand here. So let's pass seven, four, one. Oh, we're ready to keep going. So we'll do a yes on that. So we have one, four, seven, one, four in bands. It's a little bit risky, but four numbers from one to four, it's only going to hit maybe two hands in consecutive run. So I wouldn't be too concerned about that. We got another keeper, a nine bam. Now all we really need in here is a green dragon for that pair hand. So here we have one, two, five. This is getting a little bit risky because we're, we're doing a one, two and two, two different suits at least. There's really only uh, one, one or two hands that this could be used for. The first, uh, sorry, the second hand down maybe, and then maybe the concealed hand. So it's not bad. And here now we have three tiles we can pass, so we don't even have to uh, reanalyze our hand. We can just keep going, just keeping the tiles we need for, I would say maybe the pair hand, if we can just get a green dragon, no green dragon here. All right, we're doing optional cross. And I wanted to talk about optional cross uh, too. Now, how in, um, in chat, right? a Y for yes and an N for no. If you were taught to decline a pass from your opponent, if they want one tile, write a Y or an N, yes or no. If you were taught to decline a, a, an optional cross with one tile, this is another strategy in the Charleston that can uh, protect yourself from a player who may be close to a winning hand. If somebody wants one tile, just politely decline because you could be feeding right into a winning hand. In this case, we have three, so 
we're okay to pass and our opponent wants three also. So we'll go ahead and pass that. Let's see if we can get a green dragon. No. All right, but look, we have three discards. Three discards if we play the pair hand. Now, one thing that you could consider here is playing the sixth hand down and calling discards for pungs because we could play single with the six, seven, pair, pung with the eight, con with the nine. We could pung the eight now and build on that sixth hand down. So at this point, you would just make the decision when the tiles are discarded as to whether or not you want to commit to an exposable hand, that sixth hand down, or stick with this pair hand and hope for a green dragon. The challenge is that green dragon is a pair gap. If you have a gap, you should downgrade that option for optimization. So the more optimal hand in this case because of the gap is the sixth hand down under consecutive run. Any, any questions or concerns about this particular exercise? And anybody could unmute and comment. But this is also giving you the flexibility of, you could still do the second hand down, right, in the consecutive round, just depending on what you get. If you get sevens and nines. Or even another, yeah, well, e either way, you need four flowers. Oh, so right. you could. Yeah, flexible you, with this. Pardon? It's a very flexible hand. It, it is. You can, you can really ride the fence on both of those hands until a discard goes down. So until an eight bam in this case goes down, you really don't have to make a decision and you can just keep gathering until you run out of discards, which are these three on the end. These are our discards. So technically we have five discards if we played the six hand down and we have six discards if we play the third hand down. But if we play that pair hand, even if we get one green dragon, that would fill a gap. If we get a green dragon, I would play the pair hand. How many of you would play the pair hand? Write a P in chat if you would play the pair hand here. I would love to know what people would play in this case. Or you can unmute yourselves. Yeah, unmute. Having interaction is good. We welcome it if you'd like. I mean, if you, if you want to be vocal. <laughs> So we'll do one more and then we'll go into a little bit of the pick and discard and see what we can get in if you, if you like. Shall we do one more? Oh, I think we can go on, I, I think. Oh, you mean oops. Or what the group wants you. <laughs> All right, I think I clicked yes to exit the table. So let's okay. wait let's, for the- let's, let's do that. This, that's what we're, we're here for to practice the Charleston modeling. Okay, um, let's, while we're waiting for the game to catch up, let's talk about passing blind. So um, does anybody in watching struggle with the decision to pass blind, right? Y for yes or N for no? If you struggle with, with the decision of when to pass blind, right, yes, why for yes and for no? And, and let's see what the consensus is on that. Okay, so I'm gonna join this free practice table. And I wanna talk about, again, the handout that you're gonna be getting. We have a section in here for passing blind. So the purpose of the Charleston is, is to gather tiles that strengthen the starting hand and leave you with hopefully four tiles or less for discards going into the pick and discard phase of the game. And again, you want to make building your hand the priority and passing defensively the second priority. So here's kind of a, a little situation table that I've made based on my years of playing the game and sort of a um, yes or no situation. So on the left, we have the situation and then the middle we have whether or not to pass blind and then the right is what is the next step. So if you're between two categories, do you pass blind? No. Choose the category that uses your multiples, or if you have no multiples, most of your tiles. If there are gaps in one of the categories, choose the category with no gaps. The next one is, if you're between hands, 
in a category. Do you pass blind? No. Choose the hand that uses the multiple, same logic. If you have no multiples, choose the hand that uses most of your tiles. If there are gaps, choose the hand that has no gaps. Okay, the next one. If you are committed to a hand with four or more discards, or if you're committed to a hand and you have a gap with three discards, do you pass blind? No. Pass as normal for the second left. If you run out of discards for the cross pass, you might need to sacrifice a tile, but you can recover because you're going into the pick and discard phase of the game. If you're playing a jokerless hand with singles, pass a single tile because it can be claimed to win. If you are not playing a jokerless hand, pass a tile that will not leave a gap. So like if, if you're playing, for example, the, the second hand down and you have one, two and two ones, don't pass a two because that would create a gap in your hand. Pass a one if you have to. And then finally, if you're committed to a hand with two or fewer discards, or if you have risky tiles like a flower, a multiple, dragons, wins, like numbers and pairs, and you don't wanna pass those, then pass blind. The number of tiles you pass blind is situational, but pass as few blind as possible. A risky pass may be worth the risk. If you are set, and that means that you can claim a discard to complete every block on the hand, or if you're two tiles from a ready hand, Regardless, pass the most innocuous tiles, especially because you don't know, you won't want, uh, you won't know the supplemental tiles you're getting from your incoming pass. So, for example, you want to pass as few tiles as possible because what happens if the tile that you unknowingly add to your hand creates a pair? You're not going to know. So you want to minimize the number of tiles. Pass minimally. So that would be passing blind. And then that kind of leads into when to stop the Charleston. And the concepts are the same. You use the same logic. Between two categories, don't stop the Charleston. Between two hands in a category, don't stop the Charleston. Pick a hand, release tiles so you can keep doing the Charleston. Because you're giving up nine tiles to build your hand. If you are committed to a hand and you have lots of discards, keep going. If you know what hand you're playing and you have no gaps and you have three or fewer discards, that's when I would stop the Charleston. Incidentally, if you stop the Charleston and you have three tiles to pass, you may get some grumbling at the table. People might say, why did you stop the Charleston? You have three tiles to pass. Well, what happens if you get three keepers? Then you're gonna be stuck and you're gonna to have to break up your hand for that optional cross. So if this happens to me, I say I want two. And that way I don't get so much grumbling. I have three, but I say I only have two to lessen the blow on my opponents. And I say, I just want two. And a, a lot of people will pa uh, stop the Charleston if they have only two tiles to pass. So I hope that you found that helpful. Let's do one more uh, Charleston modeling here based on all these different strategies. And um, we'll see what, what we can do with these tiles. So here we have <clears throat> a flower, excuse me, uh, one BAM, four BAM, nine BAM singles. Then we have two, three, nine in cracks. And in our, our dots, we have one, two, three, five, seven. We have a pair of five dots and then a white dragon. So guess where we start? Give me an applause if you pick the five dot pair. Do this if you, if you pick the five dot pair. That's where we're gonna start, five dot. That's going to be the strength, the starting position of gathering our tiles. And in this case, we have a lot of one through five. And so that's what I would pass, the big numbers. I'd pass the big numbers and keep one through five. So by looking at the tiles that we may or may not use here on the right, we have 
a flower and a white dragon. Well, I would not pass those. Not when we have all of these tiles. We don't even know what hand we're playing yet. But I still would not pass those risky tiles. We have two nines and a seven. So I would not pass two nines. I would whittle down my options in my number tiles here, one through five, and I would pass defensively. So I would pass one of each suit. So I would likely give up a crack. So here we have one, two, three, five. We have a gap, no four for the very first hand. We do have a one, four. That might actually be a, a good tile to pass, in which case we could pass one of each suit by just picking the other nine and stop the analysis. So let's pass and see what we get. So here we have one, two, five, one, two, three, five, gap no four, but then we have a four bam and a two, three in cracks. Here we picked up a six. Now we could easily go from three, uh, one through five to two through six or three through six, but we ended up with a pair in here. That's when I would reassess because now we have five, nine, five, nine. We have no seven. So I don't think I would play five, seven, nine. What I might consider though is the concealed hand building around the multiples, which is five and nine. We have one, three, five and a nine. Now we do have gaps for the five, seven and bams, but this would be building around the multiples. Let's see what happens and play it out. So we're going to pass, let's keep bigger numbers and see that could fill in with consecutive. So let's just keep the six. Let's pass four, two, eight. Let's see if we can get a five bam, seven bam for that concealed hand. And this would be leveraging the two multiples. So we picked one up, the seven. And incidentally, we did get a six. So we have six, seven, nine, really the six, we're gonna hold for joker bait, which is another strategy. How many of you know about joker bait? Give me an applause if you know about joker bait. I can't see everybody's hands, but I'll share about that if we have time. So we're going to pass these three. Let's see if we can get a five bam. We have a gap, but that five bam is a single tile. So even though it's a gap, it's a single tile. So we might be okay with it. All right, so here now we have a pung of six bams. We're ready to do the, uh, uh, the second Charleston. Now this is where the do I want to stop the Charleston question comes in. We really have a hand here. It does have a gap, no five bam, but that gap is a single tile. We have the, the concealed hand, which is a 35 point hand, but we're left with a pung. So the decision is, to go for this concealed hand and break up the pung so that we can pass defensively with a one, two, six. Stop the Charleston, which I would not do because we have way too many discards. I would probably let the six go in this case and go ahead and continue. One of the, the that clarifier in that situational table was if you have four discards or less, or three discards or less, and you know what hand you're playing with no gaps, stop the Charleston. But we don't really qualify with these tiles. So I would break up that, that pung and stick with the consecutive hand. So what we're hoping for is a five bam. So we're gonna keep going and we'll keep the six bam. See if we can get a five bam. Oh, we got close. All right, we're gonna continue passing. This is a little risky, but it is one of each suit. And incidentally, one of the things that you might wanna consider when you're passing risky passes like this is the value of your hand. In this case, we're playing a 35 point hand. So I would think the risk is worth it since we have, all, we have nearly the full hand. It's just, we need to build up. And that five band is the, is the risk at the moment. Okay, so now we're at the optional cross. We have two ones, so I would not pass like numbers. I probably, in this case, would pass two and keep that pair for joker bait. And I'll explain that in a minute if you guys are interested. I'd say I want two, and that's just because I don't wanna pass like numbers to my opponent. 
So we'll pass two and we still have a potential to get that five BAM we want. Oh, we got close. We got the six BAM back. <laughs> so that's how we ended up here. We have six discards, which is really what I call this four discards with Joker bait, which is a silver lining. So we're playing the concealed hand. We have four discards really, or three discards with a big hunk of Joker bait. And let me explain Joker bait. And that should take us to right up to our one hour time frame. Joker bait is a term coined by Tom Sloper. Does everybody know who Tom Sloper is? Tom Sloper is a longtime Mahjong enthusiast. He plays many versions. He's a world traveler uh, for Mahjong. He plays in a lot of tournaments and uh, he's written, he has a website with a, with a FAQ uh, on, um, on Mahjong. And it's not just American Mahjong, it's all kinds of Mahjong. So if you're interested after this, look, at, look for or Google Sloperama, S-L-O-P-E-R, AMA, Sloperama, that's the name of his website. So he coined this term, Joker bait. What you do is you hold multiples. In this case, we have a pung, so it's pretty big, but you hold it even though you don't need it. And then around the middle wall, which would be right around, let's see here, you kind of have to visualize a full wall. So right here, we have these tiles that were dealt out. I would say, right here would be the last wall. So this would be the third wall right around in here. I would say right about where this break is between the walls, you want to discard one. Somebody at the table makes an exposure with a joker and on your next turn, you use the other one to make the exchange. That's called joker bait. I played uh, Friday night and it worked two turns in a row for me and I won with joker bait. It's a hit or miss, but when it works, it's very exciting. All right, should we just open up with some questions? I can't, oh, here oh, we go. I was say, maybe if you wanna, maybe we stop sharing your screen, give people a chance to. Sure. Are you more comfortable talking or? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Does anybody have any questions about the strategies? And like I said, there was a lot that was here. Um, I will be handing out, I will follow up with an email where we, you discuss really, Michelle Kate, Kate made a great workbook for us to work on. And then I did have one question with, with that, the Mahjong time that you were playing and you kept going into free practice, but is that because you have the more upgraded membership or is there a free practice just to have a free practice? Um, okay, so it, on Mahjong time, in Mahjong school, they have a table for every category on the card so you can practice making decisions for a particular category. Like let's say you wanna practice playing a singles and pairs category hand or in that category, you wanna practice making decisions on a singles and pairs hand. You could play at the singles and pairs table and it will give you the potential for that kind of a hand so there's a cat a cat a table for every category and then there's a whole bunch of tables that say free practice and those tiles are dealt random just randomly dealt tiles and uh when you click on a table the next another one would render so there's always a table for you to play at and you could play free in Mahjong school at Mahjong time 24 seven with no limit. And then if anybody else has a question, if you wanna unmute yourself or put it in the chat and I'll do it for you. Or if it was a lot of information, now you wanna play and then come back to this. Use that, use that um, handout that you get and maybe add what maybe pick your top three strategies that resonated with you and apply them to the way you play either the top three or one at a time. Maybe pick one if it's too overwhelming because I know we went over a lot of strategies, but you could pick maybe top three, two or one wherever you're comfortable 
And did you want to share about um, what we're going to do in the near future? Well, we were, we were, Michelle and I were discussing of perhaps with this group, we'll come back in maybe, uh, maybe a month or two, we'll, we'll figure out a date. Michelle and I will work on a date and come back. And if you worked on these strategies and then coming back and saying how these strategies helped you, what mother kind is a follow up. And then Michelle will also come back with us in May and help us go through the new card. Yes. Because that's, that's always, like you said, always a leveler, a, l a little bit of a leveler. Us, mm -hmm. us, we're all newbies when we get the new card. Yeah. Well, I do this new card analysis and it has, it, every year it has helped a lot of people. So I, I'm hoping to deliver some value for you with that episode. Great. And I hope you found value in this session. Thank you for coming. Thanks, everybody. You know, it, like you said, last chance for any many questions. Up. Oh. oh, here we go. Uh, um, we have. Can you go through a session that you need to change your strategy? Um, I, I missed the chat at the very end there. What did it say? Let's see. That very end piece. I, I missed the last sentence. If you need to change your strategy in the middle of the game. Okay, so maybe the next session we can go into actually playing the game. So yes, what this is where situational awareness is key. And I, I do have a presentation on situational awareness. So if you want to have me back, if you enjoyed the way I think, <laughs> not everybody does. Uh, so <laughs> the next one to the next one to go on to, like you said, situational awareness. Situational awareness. Yes. Know, playing the walls is very important to your strategy at the second wall, your strategy at the third wall. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then what is being exposed? What's not being exposed? And what's in the discards? And you should use all those things to help you with your decision making. And if you, and that would be playing online. If you're playing in person, I know some people are, some people are not, but if you are playing in person, you can also leverage body language and verbal tells. I have a, a whole presentation on tells. You can gather a lot of information from your opponents based on what they say and do. Or my group is here. They know what I sing. <laughs> I'm the yeah. worst. I'm the easiest to read. <laughs> have you ever heard anyone say, I don't have any flowers. Yeah. Where are all the jokers? You don't want to say things like that because you know what that means. That means they're in the wall and that means more for me. So I can, you know, hope for tiles because they're saying they don't have any. Well, there's more for me. Gives me some hope. Very, very interesting. Well, I'd like, again, I'd like to thank everybody who came today. I'd like to thank Michelle. Um, as, as the group can tell here, I'm a Mahjong enthusiast trying to get past the beginner stage onto the next stage. So uh, Michelle will be coming back um, and we, we, will figure, we will figure this out. She and I will discuss about, and like I said, I like that moving on, especially with this group to moving on to uh, a wall strategy. Okay. And that could also be helpful maybe with some of these uh, more sophisticated Mahjong players might want to pop into that one. The ones uh, you can always, always learn something. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I am going to end this recording. So thank you everyone.